Welcome to Frame of Reference, informed, intelligent conversations about the issues and challenges facing everyone in today's world. In-depth interviews to help you expand and inform your frame of reference. Now here's your host, Raul Labresh. Well, welcome to another episode of Frame of Reference, Profiles in Leadership. And uh, I have to tell you, I, uh, I haven't been looking forward to an interview as much as I have uh, to this one today. And that largely has to do with the first time I had a conversation with my, my guest today. Uh, we, I, I think, I know I was, I hope he was as, as well, very exhilarated by that conversation. Um, and I, I even alluded to it in that interview at that point that it is, uh, for me, very rewarding, very energizing to talk with a fellow lifelong learner. Um, you know, we, we really do not get older unless we allow ourselves to stop learning. Um, and even though our, odd, our bodies may age and start to creak and crack and complain about things we do to them, our minds continue to expand as long as we're willing to learn. And this gentleman, Emmanuel Daniel, who is sitting across the screen from me in Singapore now, folks. The last time we talked, he was in Dubai, and now he's in Singapore. And I have to tell you, Emmanuel, I am still in Sauk Prairie. I was in Sauk Prairie. I am now in Sauk Prairie. I think the farthest I've gotten away from Sauk Prairie is Schultzburg, Wisconsin. <laughs> so <laughs> Found it. <laughs> well, it, I guess you could... Here's the, here's the pun who has a frame of reference for the both of us. <laughs> Yes, mine is very static. Yours is very dynamic. So although I try to be dynamic as well. So uh, Emmanuel Daniel is a uh, a global thought leader. He is an expert in uh, so many things related to the world of finance. And his particular uh, bent, I will say, is the personalization of banking. Um, and that that's a concept that even as I've tried to explain it to friends of mine since our interview, um, it, it is uh, interesting to me that people understand the concept when you start to talk about the way that it, it works, but they, they still are stymied by how does such a thing develop and how will it develop. So that's part of what I hope we can cover somewhat today, um, but it, right. it uh, will likely take many conversations to do that because uh, it's dense. It's a, a dense topic. And what I've appreciated about you more than anything, Emmanuel, is your understanding and breadth of knowledge regarding history, the history of finance, as well as the history of humans using, utilizing finance. But I also found in reading your book that you referred to Star Trek. And that right away made me <laughs> go, I want to talk with him more. <laughs> so, <laughs> Emmanuel, thank you for joining me again today. Thank it's you, just a pleasure. And Yes. And, you know, the thing is this, the thing about the personalization of finance is that as I was completing my first book, I realized that if finance is going to be personalized, uh, society is going to be personalized, you know, and that's what uh, I think that's that was the, the, the spark in our conversation, uh, which is that, oh, my goodness, we are not just looking at finance here, we're looking at um, all of society. And then and then our, our conversation went into people's civilizations and all that. So, yeah. you know, let's let's uh, continue where we left off it the last time. Yes. And I, I, you know, I thought of something too, you, with your name, Emmanuel Daniel, I think we could call you God is with us in the lion's den. I, I think that would be a good way to think of you. So you, you are there amongst the lions to help uh, get us all uh, protected and out of the lion's you know, den. It's interesting that you say that. that. There was something that my father did when we were growing up. Um, he would go behind a door and he would pray. Uh, and, you know, my father is Daniel, right? So, uh, and and uh, he'd do that every day, once uh, once a day. Uh, and, I mean, you know, I probably lost a lot of my religious religiosity. But uh, this thing about... Um, being mindful of a force that is larger than us, and um, you know, and and uh, and and imbi imbibing it, imbibing it, and uh, and and uh, submitting to it uh, is something very deep inside me. Uh, and Daniel, a man of prayer, Daniel in front of the lions. Uh, and and the funny thing about parents is that it's not what they tell you; it's what they do that sticks for you, yeah. sticks with you for the rest of your life. So th there was a real Daniel in my life, and that was my dad. So, um, <laughs> you know, 
Yeah. Well, it's interesting that and, he gave and, you the first name of Emmanuel. You know, that, uh, that I, right. I didn't even know what that name meant until much later in my life. Um, you know, we sang it at Christmas time, Emmanuel, Emmanuel. But it, there's uh, not really. <laughs> what? I'm sorry? It's, so, uh, and, and they were already singing Eman- O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, uh, preparing for Christmas. So, so that's where I got my name, exactly. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, Emmanuel, yes, you remember last time we talked a little bit at the beginning about uh, our favorite things. And I've been thinking of unusual favorite things for you. So I will see how, how far I can get away. And one of the more arcane things I came up with is, Daniel, do you have a favorite piece of furniture? Do you have a, 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 a chair or a table or something in, in your possession or that uh, you, you, perhaps you're just aware of that you really hold, it holds some special value, some special significance to you? As in sentimental, uh, I've tried not to, uh, and because I've lived in several places, I've tried not to be attached to any uh, particular piece of furniture. Uh, the, anything that, the thing that comes closest are my bookshelves. Uh, and my bookshelves are out of sync uh, with my house. Uh, they, uh, they, they're, they're from my previous house and, I, and the house before that. So uh, it, it just got carried in. And so the rest of the furniture uh, does not sync with the bookshelves. Um, <laughs> they seem out of so, place. <laughs> yeah, so there's a sentimental element there. But uh, the, the thing that Holds prime position, uh, prime position in my house is my dining table, uh, and the dining table uh, sits in the dining area, and and it uh, it's where I do everything. Um, I work there, I I eat there, I I, I talk with friends there. So uh, you know, so if you ask me a a, a, a piece of furniture that holds a prime position at home it's uh it's my, it's my dining table uh and if it's a piece of furniture that's got a sentimental value it's my bookshelves and i'm now going through a incredible uh a cathartic experience in that i'm just thinking whether i still need to have my bookshelves because um i now read more out of kindle than i do uh physical books and i just like the idea of having all my books on on my app um, you know, and anything I even bought physically, I, I try to get the digital version. Not, it's only because the way I read has changed. Um, you know, in, in the old days, I just go reach out to the book on my bookshelf and I'll read a chapter or a section and then, OK, I got it. Uh, but today um, I'll do it the same, but but on, on, on your phone and I'll do that on a plane. I'll do that, um, you know, uh, when I want to reference something. Uh, I don't read. I don't tend to read books uh, cover to cover unless they are really captivating. Uh, I read them to catch an idea, and then uh, and then sometimes when it's a difficult book, I also uh, you know watch a YouTube video on the book to understand some perspective, and then make make the rest of the book palatable to me. Um, very often, I think these days we tend to stop at chapter two or chapter three of a book, not realizing that the author, especially if it's a good author, uh, is thinking about um, building his idea. He's taking it further, except that uh, for the most part, we, once we caught the essence of the book, we stopped reading it. You know? so, so the bookshelf uh, was good in that I could just reach out to you know, pull out the book and read it. And, um, and I only have three bookshelves, uh, which means that... Wow. Um, it, it, I have uh, I have another three boxes of books that, that are in the in the in the storeroom, uh, but only you know three shelves uh, displayed at any time, <laughs> and and choose which three of uh, which which books make it to that list that's up there that I just keep going back to <laughs> refer. You know, Your Harry cycle. Potter. So yeah, oh, and then keep going back to it. yeah. Uh, you know, there are books there that, that I just keep going back to. So, so the bookshelf has a sort of a intellectual and emotional, uh, um, you know, place in my life. Yeah. Are there books that are were seminal books to you that that uh, you know you read at a particular time in your life that you find you're going back to because there's a message there that you need to keep reiterating in your I life? Uh, I don't know why, but you know, like um, um, there, there's a a South African writer called Nadine Godaima, and and uh, I caught her like maybe when I was 
in my twenties, probably or, or early thirties. And and there's a book, uh, my father's story, or something like that. And um, and I I keep going back to it because it's a it's a fictitious it's a fiction a piece of fiction, but but it reflects on South African society. I keep going back to it just because at the time that I read it. Um, it, it had an emotional bearing on me uh, and something to do with, uh, you know, the integrity of fathers at home, um, that sort of thing. And, and um, how fathers struggle to uh, hold family together in a society that's changing and all that. So, um, uh, so I keep going back to that one and I go back to, you know, various other books. But that particular one, uh, I know nothing about South African society. I, it's not my community, but somehow uh, something about that book uh, caught my um, intrigue and, and has, is a reference in that way. So so that's one. And, and there are other books that way that I keep going back to, um, you know, Alan Patton, who, who wrote, um, you know, A Cry in the Beloved Country uh, and, and many others. So, so there, you know, there are books that I keep going back to. And there are books that... Uh, came across as textbook, um, the competitive advantage of nations, for example, uh, you know, and, uh, and uh, that it was, it was, uh, it was an important book to read because everybody else took it seriously. But today I find myself um, um, disintegrating the ideas uh, into a new idea. So that, in other words, I'm growing out of that book. Uh, and that's actually my next book, which is, uh, uh, you know, the, the Winning Civilization. Uh, and, and I'm saying that the Western way of looking at the relationship between countries uh, as a didactic relationship, uh, you know, it's either you or me, and then it's you or me, and then, then something else comes out of it. Uh, it's not necessarily... Um, you know, the defining relationship within states, um, you know, because uh, now we have alternative ideas floating around uh, in, in, in the world that we need to start thinking differently. So there are states today that are on ascendancy, but, uh, but are not driven by that competitive element. It's driven by the ability to hold itself together. And I'm thinking of countries like Indonesia, uh, which, you know, interestingly, um, the, when you stop hearing about a country, something good might be happening in that. You know, uh, we all know that Philippines. Uh, uh, when we lay, when we say the word Philippines, we think Marcos and um, you know and uh, and and the corruption and the revolution and all that. But that was now. That is now thirty years ago. Uh, you know, and when the new Marcos came became president, guess what? Uh, he's is one in a line of presidents whose names we have forgotten. Uh, and that's because the country is so stable today that it doesn't matter who the president is. Uh, you know, the, the Senate holds to the, together, the, you know, the, 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 the body politic uh, is able to contain uh, the, the presidents as they come and go. In fact, the one just uh, who just ended his uh, presidency, uh, Duterte, uh, when he became president, the United States became very upset because he was saying all the wrong things. Uh, and he was such a, you know, rightist, uh, no, he was a he was a populist, sorry, and and you know uh, conservative populist, and uh, and and then he came and he went, and 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 we are now into another presidency. So uh, Indonesia is a trillion dollar economy today. Uh, mm -hmm. It was a basket case, um, you know, at the end of the Asian financial crisis, uh, and today it's uh, you know it's it's one of the most progressive uh, democracies in Asia. So when you stop hearing about a country. Something good might be happening, uh, you know. It's coming, <laughs> which is not uh, newsworthy you know, most times. So, <laughs> so yeah. okay. So that that's one favorite question. Uh, we uh, we took I don't know how many minutes with that. So I'll I'll, I'll just take time for one more question because um, we have so much other other thing to talk about. Um, but I have to I do have to say something about books because you were talking about the way that you you read books and that you prefer a Kindle. I would agree with you. I, I prefer a Kindle as well. And I'm I'm seriously contemplating getting rid of a lot of books that I have because I've realized that, well, the digital copy is available, so why not just get that? But I did. The last time we talked, I made an, a promise to you that I would read your entire book um, that, that about the personalization of banking. And I failed. And I failed because of the way I read books, which is I look at the table of contents in a book and I gravitate towards the the 
the titles of chapters that interest me the most. And then I've got further weighted by down by the idea of identity. And I read the started to read the chapter on identity. And what I appreciate and loathe about your writing at the same time is <laughs> so I, I hope I understand the nature of this. I appreciate that there is great density to what you write about. There is great knowledge and a profound understanding of the bigger picture in the way that you write. So frankly, what I loathe about it is that it forces me to just stop and think about the words on the page and the ideas being expressed by those words in ways that is tremendously time consuming for me, at least. Um, I can't just take it at face value. You know, a lot of things are written sort of in a fluffy, entertaining, or just, you know, uh, a passage of time. Yours requires work. Um, so I would warn people that are going to read your your books, and I encourage them deeply to read your books because there's so much uh, that is thought about and talked about that is important and meaningful, not only for now but going forward. Yeah, so when I write, I go back to first principles, and uh, I... You know, and then I leave it to the reader to figure out its application. Uh, in fact, after the book is published, I realized that that's not exactly the commercially viable way to do uh, to write a book, <laughs> which is, uh, you know, the question in people's minds are, what's in it for me? Uh, you know, but first principle is, uh, here's the first principles. Now let's think about everything else from here. So, so like in, in the book, in the chapter on identity, for example, I, I, I talk about energy uh, and, and how energy in nature uh, is the energy of the sun that is uh, translated through chlorophyll to become energy that we consume. Uh, you know, and, and money is uh, exactly that, which is a uh, token is something of value that carries, uh, that that results in something that we can use, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and, uh, and, and that's how we need to think about the future of money. Uh, and there is not a single banker who thinks it that way. Uh, and yet, uh, when you go back to first principles and think it that way, uh, everything is happening that is happening in cryptocurrencies, for example, right now. Uh, and, and the battle between central bank digital currencies and so on, um, you, you need to look for the underlining uh, uh, threat uh, that, that um, you know, that the proponent is trying to resolve. So like right now, for example, uh, you know, the, the central banks around the world are thinking about uh, central bank digital currencies, uh, one for consumers to use and another for, uh, you know, they call them wholesale central bank digital currencies, which is uh, used for transacting between countries, uh, cross-border, uh, when it involves multiple currencies. Um, you know, then the question I ask is, uh, what is the problem that they're trying to solve here? Uh, and, and, you know, and so that from there, I can think through, uh, you know, where they're taking it. Uh, you know, so so the purpose of my writing so far, and in fact, I probably need to modify that if I was if I were to be a little bit more uh, helpful to the reader, is that uh, to to also give examples. But the examples are coming in finance, at least the examples are coming fast and furious. Uh, you know, right after I write my book, the book was published in uh, September, October last year. And October was also the month that they launched Chat GPT, uh, you know, and and uh, generative pre-trained uh, transformers, uh, which then takes how uh, technology is organized in large institutions like banks to a whole new level, uh, you know. And uh, you know, nothing I said is outdated. In fact, they form the first principles of how to think through how a bank should be organized. Uh, but uh, but I wasn't giving the the practical examples uh, when I wrote it. So. So, um, you know, the, the thing about predicting the future is that um, you are trying to make sense of the direction of the future rather than, you know, do a laundry list of things that are going to happen in the future. And I think that a number of Alvin Toffler, for example, uh, and, and a number of others in the early days of futuristic writing in the U.S., uh, they they focused on laundry lists. You know, the future will have this, 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 and this. You know, whereas what I'm focusing on are the first principles from which 
the future is being created. Um, you know, so I, I'm, I, I, I will, I'll keep improving as I go along. Uh, so my, my next book about the winning civilization, again, I'm going back into first principles of what makes a civilization uh, and, and what are the, you know, irrefutable first principles of how civilizations evolve. Uh, and then, um, you know, I have to be helpful to the reader to say, this is where we are today. And, and uh, um, you know, these are the issues that we are facing today. You know, so... Um, so it's an interesting discipline, uh, the whole idea of being able to um, construct, um, you know, a, a useful idea of how to think where so many things that are happening at the same time is taking us. Well, and I, I would have to say that perhaps your way of writing is not profitable, but uh, to some to some extent in some circles, but um, I found it extremely profitable to me personally because it does elicit uh, I mean you do give examples it's not you know you do give some analogies that are really helpful the ice industry you know is one that you come back to repeatedly um, but there, there's also a an openness to taking that knowledge that information and applying it to your one your own personal life and I found I just in reading that one chapter I have a list of probably 20 questions and things that it makes me think of and that that's where the, that density comes into play because there's there's just so many things that are layered into that, and part of that comes from your knowledge of history and your knowledge of trends and where the origins of some of the things we do today, you know, came from, um, and that that allows people to extrapolate all kinds of you know oh that's why this happened oh that's why this happened so uh, but I mean, then my other my next question is do you have a favorite historical personality? Whoa! <laughs> I have, of course, I enjoy all of them. Uh, lately, I'm thinking of, I've been thinking a lot about Napoleon, right? Really, and, Napoleon? Uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean that's because I was in, I was in, uh, uh, you know, Estonia and Latvia and, and uh, Lithuania uh, just last the last three weeks, and the whole thing about these countries is that they were like the the the, the stepping the mat. Uh, the, the doormat of the uh, of the two big civilizations at that time, which was the French and the and the Russians, and how Napoleon used uh, Estonia as a uh, you know launching pad into Russia, uh, mm. and he failed uh, dramatically and so on. So so I do you know historically is uh, you know other people that I think a lot about. Uh, I think I do think about Napoleon quite a bit uh, because of his uh, ability to organize society so quickly. Um, you know, it's it's not that he's warmongering, but his uh, building of uh, codes and charters and uh, rules of everyday life uh, that helped him to, you know, create rules that we use to, to, to this day. Um, you know, and, and uh, so I like that about him very much. And uh, the fact that he organized the largest army, you know, in Europe of a million people, a uh, million men, uh, you know, and of, of many different societies, uh, uh, you know, marching towards uh, Russia, um, you know, that, 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 include, that requires incredible organizational skills. Um, and, of course, then you build backwards and you look at Philip of Macedonia, for example, and, you know, at the end of the Bronze Age, uh, the ability to get, uh, you know, a small platoon of men organized into a troop, uh, uh, you know, enabled the Greeks to build an empire that went all the way out to India, um, you know, and, and nobody stopped them along the way. It's not as if they were a huge army. They were just organized. That's it. You know, and, uh, and, and that you can do that uh, in the case of Alexander the Great, it's like you can do that before the, before you're 33 years old uh, and you're done, you know, like you, and, and the rest of history is unraveling what you've done. Um, so, so different people, uh, different personalities and different influences, uh, but this incredible ability to organize um, huge uh, civilizations in the simplest possible way uh, that, uh, uh, you know, that uh, um, intrigues me a lot. Uh, and a number of British, uh, you know, colonialists like uh, uh, Clive, who, you know, who, who, who started the, uh, the, the um, British rule of India, uh, and then Stanford Raffles, who, who only spent 
um, a maximum of six we uh, six months in Singapore, and he is today. If you come down to Singapore, he is uh, he is attributed to be the founder of Singapore. And in the six months that he was in Singapore, he all he did was throw up uh, a city plan uh, where all the different communities should live. Uh, and and that plan is still recognizable today on the streets of Singapore, which is you know the Malay Quarter, the Indian Little India, uh, where Chinatown is, um, and uh, the British Empire. If you travel from uh, from Calcutta to Hong Kong, you'll see the same formula: the cricket field, uh, the Anglican Church, uh, the the civic building, uh, and the cricket club. Right? Uh, they all. Uh, you know, align next to each other in exactly the same proportion in every city, every city that was uh, part of the British Empire. Uh, and mm-hmm. uh, it, it, it thrills me that I can go to Kenya, to South Africa, to uh, to Hong Kong even, and, and you see that uh, that the center of um, administration uh, was was very simply this, the Anglican Church, uh, the, the the civic buildings, the post office, uh, and the cricket club, uh, you know. And and at the height of the East India Company, uh, it was 1,000 very young Englishmen, uh, you know, uh, sent to uh, rule the empire where the, where the sun never set, uh, you know, and 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 in in many of those places, uh, they would uh, they would position one resident uh, who looks after the entire uh, society or, or province uh, for which they are given uh, responsibility. Um, you know, and that's all it was. That was the British Empire. It wasn't like you know a thousand men, British men in one place, overlording over you know another thousand people or something like that. It was always one person overlording an entire population. Uh, so the ability of men uh, in, in, in their time uh, to be organized uh, or to organize society around very simple principles, uh, that that thrills me a lot. And the leaders who have been able to do that uh, over time, uh, I, I pay attention a lot to them. So so I mentioned Napoleon and then, you know, uh, Philip of Macedonia uh, and, and, and a few others that way, yeah. It's interesting how you, you talk about the, uh, the way that those communities, those cities are designed. Um, it makes me think of uh, one of the foundational elements that I remember from your book is this idea of a communal currency. Um, you know, there, there's that same focus upon the physical uh, geography and location of buildings um, that that is has been agreed on by multiple cultures apparently um, that that is a you know a valuable way of organizing our the the structures the the prime locations within our community um, it, it, that 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 ties to your uh, your concept of there being a communal currency that is of value within that communities has an agreed upon value within that current that uh, community and how that uh, I- people prosper as have, a result of that. I have a lot to say on that because I think that uh, one of the um, you know issues that finance is struggling with is how not to be uh, extractive of communities but supportive of communities. Um, in fact, today, if you go to any of the financial centers, New York, London, Singapore, Hong Kong, um, as financial centers, uh, they over-reward uh, the people in the intermediation business, uh, and then extract value from the rest of the community. Uh, you know, and so it's difficult to be a uh, entrepreneur or a um, you know or, or a uh, startup uh, in these cities uh, because they are so expensive. Uh, the best talent goes to finance, uh, and so finance is extractive of the rest of the community. And that's why I told my my Jewish friends that uh, you know. Be grateful that Tel Aviv is not a uh, is not a financial center. Uh, let the financial center be somewhere else, so that Tel Aviv can continue to be an innovation center. Uh, you know that that you need to go somewhere else to raise capital, uh, and and that's what I noticed that that you know where finance is extractive rather than uh, rather than contributive to society. But there's an alternative model, which is as you said, a community currency idea and it's a very simple uh, concept it always existed and guess what there are I, we I, I identified at least five community currencies in the US uh, today 
you know, and where in small closed communities, uh, they create a token that recognizes, um, you know, I informal work uh, and informal uh, duties that people have with each other uh, from which they can, uh, you know, extract value and, and, um, and give it a value that the person doing a favor to a friend, painting your house uh, or helping you out with your garden, uh, you know, can, um, can be given a token that then he can use to buy food, uh, you know, and, uh, and you think that, you know, uh, why is that necessary? And that's because there are pockets of society which are very, very stable, closed communities uh, that can function uh, regardless of, uh, you know, the rest of the country, uh, you know, and, and, uh, and can solve its own problems as a result. Uh, and then when you put technology on it, uh, like blockchain and so on, uh, it helps you to be able to track the transaction uh, and, and, and run it viably uh, within that closed community in something that you couldn't do in the past. In the past, you, you probably have to create a physical token for example, a, a piece of paper, an IOU, or something like that. You know, so um, um, you know, and, and then you extract, you you extrapolate that into uh, gaming. How entire communities um, actually play games to uh, generate tokens, which they then exchange for money that they go out and buy fish in the market. Um, these are things that are happening today. Uh, that. Uh, you know that the, the, the digitization of finance is making it possible. Uh, you know, and and, the, and, the, and it exists very, very uh, um, clearly within the networked society, uh, which is becoming a reality more and more. Uh, you know, uh, those of us who are. Um, you know, who, whose job requires us to go to the office, drive into town, and all that, um, don't realize that uh, there are parts of society, part, there are communities in parts of the world where they're not plugged in. They were not previously plugged into the global economy, and and today they are uh, because of uh, gaming, for example. Uh, you know, and uh, and that they can generate value. Um, there's a lot to be said about these tokens that are generated through gaming. Um, that that you know this is like uh, um, you know it's it's a uh, perception it's uh, it's not real um, you know and that gaming itself is not a uh, uh, a real economic activity um, but uh, these are things that are important to society which is the ability to interact with each other uh, compete with each other uh, and generate value from there um, you know so so there are there are um, there are models that used to exist in the physical world that are being transact transacted to the digital world, um, you know, as we become more networked. Um, and so I try to track all of them as they, as they evolve. Well, and you bring up an interesting point when you discuss that even, uh, that there is a, 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 and I guess I'm thinking of this perhaps with a too, too close-minded of a view, um, but that there is a difference between the community valued token and a global a globally valued token um, that there is a, a a process by which we have to be able to take that work that I did for you that I can turn into buying food somewhere within my community that there's a difference between that and a universal token which is why currencies exist right the the American dollar as a the benchmark for uh, global value is that we all accept global that there is a value to the U.S. dollar, dollar in that it is a universal way of having transactions. So how will communities evolve from the personalization of tokenization to a, a larger global sense? Is it, it, I mean, it almost means, to me, it means that each community has to have a wide array of services and products available so that they can, in fact, trade their work or their intrinsic value for things that, you know, you can't get or you can get anywhere else, but you're going to buy it within your community. I think of that like my small town. I, I will support our local businesses with my money as much as I can because they're here contributing to the rest of the community um, through, you know, donations for events that go on or whatnot. So um, what, how does that transition occur, do you think? Oh, you froze. You froze on me. Oh, darn it. Now let's wait. And I'll just edit this part out. I hope you're hearing me. I'm going to leave and come back in because we seem to be completely halted. If you can hear me, do the same, all right? 
Neil, I hope you come back. Are you back? I'm here. Oh, okay. I see. I see your initials. <laughs> I don't know uh, what. I I went offline. Because, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah, I can hear you now. Let me uh, let me get back here into recording mode. So. I think the powers that be don't like our conversation. That's what I think. So it, it, uh, it's interesting. I uh, my my phone had a message saying that it is overheated. I'm not sure why that is. Huh? That is interesting. All right. Well, I'm I'm back up. Actually, it seems like we have a bit better connection this time. So maybe this was fortuitous. Um, okay. And, and so, um, my, I think we were talking about the uh, the the process of going from an individual community based tokenization to a larger global tokenization. How how do we make that transition so that the the work that I do for someone has not only value within the community, but it lets me buy a car from Chrysler. You know that that kind of thing. So, yeah. So, community currencies are designed to solve uh, an immediate and highly localized uh, situation, uh, and to recognize value that's been created in a closed community. Uh, and uh, it usually functions best uh, in a distressed community where uh, joblessness, for example, is a high rate of uh, unemployment, uh, and in uh, you know societies that communities that uh, operate outside of the mainstream uh, in difficult parts of the country, uh, things like that. Um, you you don't transpose that or you don't extrapolate that into the rest of the country. In fact, the Kenyan example that I gave, Saparu credit, it's for a village. Um, you know, and, uh, and I think the people in the uh, NGOs, the non-government organizations, would appreciate what I'm saying about or what we just discussed about community currencies because they wish that they could create community currencies around the projects that they that they support. Uh, you know, and and then they, you know, the community uh, pulls itself up by its bootstraps uh, by mm -hmm. generating value. Uh, you know, in in activities that otherwise would not get. Uh, uh, you know, attention uh, or recognized within, uh, you know, the, the broader community or the broader country. Um, the, the problems that central banks are trying to deal with uh, is at another level altogether. Um, you know, it used to be that the currencies of the world used to be, um, you know, backed by gold. Uh, and today, um, almost all currencies are fiat, which means that central banks can print as much money as they want. They can get into indeterminate debt. Uh, and the entire politicization of uh, finance of okay. the scale. Now I'm losing your audio. Are you able yep, to now, hear me now? Yeah, I now I can hear you. I kept yeah. losing chunks of what you were saying. So. Oh, dear. You, you, as in, you weren't able to hear me. Um is there something I need to do to? Uh, uh, okay, where did you start? Where did you, where did you start losing me? Um, where I did started, you start losing? Uh, you were talking about the um, the idea of banks having this uh, capability of well, the, the fiat fiating of uh, printing money and how that. Okay, uh, let me let me let me go back to uh, community currencies and then I'll come to this. Okay. Okay. So. Um, the, the community currencies in general are created to solve highly localized uh, problems in um, highly distressed communities uh, that very often exist uh, outside the mainstream or have very specific needs, uh, such as high unemployment uh, and, you know, no um, um, discernible uh, act, you know, commercial activity, uh, stuff like that, or something in that society had broken down. Uh, and they can exist in a, a larger state. So the example that I gave, which was uh, Safaru Credit in Kenya, uh, you know, so Safaru Credit is a community currency that exists uh, within a country which has a fiat currency. Uh, and fiat currencies are designed to solve another problem altogether. That's central banking. Uh, that is the, the ability of, um, you know, governments to issue as much debt as they want uh, to solve political problems uh, at the national level and so on. Uh, 
Uh, and then, of course, uh, that gets traded um, on, on the global trading platform and so on. And then there's a, yet another dimension today, which is uh, the possibility of a global currency that is not um, that that is not uh, dictated or managed by anybody. Uh, and that currency exists. It's Bitcoin. Uh, and the fact that we have this beautiful architecture uh, of a currency that uh, is trusted by everybody uh, and is a transmission of value, which is ungovernable because of the way it's constituted um, is yet at another level, uh, which the central banks uh, you know, view as a threat uh, mm -hmm. because it undermines their own ability to continue issuing fiat currency. So we're talking about three very different uh, dimensions that are developing on their own. Uh, they don't necessarily affect each other at the moment. Uh, but at some point, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's all a case of um, you know, like like community currencies, they exist within certain situations, and when they, those situations uh, uh, cease to exist, uh, then the reason for the community currency also evaporates, uh, and and that community plugs into the rest of the of mainstream. And community currencies of great interest to uh, you know to NGOs, for example, trying to solve problems in uh, highly distressed situations or trying to create communities uh, around. Uh, activities that they do. I was in I was in Timbuktu, and the thing that struck me about Timbuktu is that you go down the main street of Timbuktu, which is a dust road, uh, on both sides of the main street, uh, there are uh, you know many many uh, NGOs from the Western world having offices uh, in Timbuktu. Uh, you know, like forty or fifty of them, and and they only come once a year to come in to uh, you know, to do some activities and then they leave. Uh, and and uh, and the whole idea is that how do you create a viable economy in a place like Timbuktu, which is a thousand five hundred kilometers away from the capital in the middle of the Sahara Desert? Uh, you know, and uh, and and how do you uh, you know get that community? Uh, up on its boot, bootstrap, so so that's a different problem related, uh, you know, relative to central bank uh, fiat currencies and the the new currencies that are coming on through cryptocurrencies. You know, as I, I thought about um, the idea of there being assets uh, that people have, either currency or bank accounts or stock uh, dividends and stock available that builds wealth, personal wealth that that can then can be used for other um, purposes. Are there immutable assets? I mean, are there? Uh, I mean, to, to me, if in a perfect society, it would be Star Trekian to the extent that there would no longer be money, people would have the things that they need and that they would contribute a value to the world around them that, uh, you know, enables them to be of worth. Um, and in, in that world, I, you know, you, you begin to see, I think, the, the elimination of things like lying, because lying is never valuable beyond, a, you know, a very small point of time, because eventually the lies are found out and it undermines the value of that currency, right? Um, and I, I would hope that we could somehow come up with immutable, immutable assets like people of integrity, or you know, people that were honest, people that were caring and compassionate and empathetic. Um, perhaps that would alleviate some of our problems in contemporary American society. If you know the signs that we have in our community say "Be kind." Um, well, I would like to see some of the folks that are active in our political communities today, um, you know, be defaulting on their loan because they're not kind. <laughs> so. <laughs> Raul, you you hit something on the on the, on you you just, you may not have realized this, but you hit the nail on the head on some on a very very interesting point here, which is lying is necessary in a markets economy, and in a markets economy, when you and I exchange something of value, I have to make sure that I get the best price for it, uh, and you must make sure that you get the best price for it. And we'd both be hiding certain facts about the transaction uh, until we can leverage the highest possible value from each other. That's a market's economy, okay? Um, we are now transitioning into a networked economy where, um, where the truth actually creates value. Um, you know, now, if you take information, uh, information is the one asset that when I give to you, 
I don't lose it. Uh, you know, and 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 when I give it to ten people, I don't become less important. I become more important mm-hmm. as a result, right? So it's the only it's the one asset that actually increases in value the more it's networked, uh, and the, and it can only network uh, if there is great transparency or what they call symmetry of information between the people transacting in in a network, uh, you know system um, you know so so we are transitioning uh, into an economy where um, where uh, visibility transparency um, uh, you know and and the symmetry of information uh, creates the value um, you know so the the interesting thing is this take take mortgages um, you know and and bank deposits for goodness sakes we just had silicon valley bank and so on uh, and what's different between uh, bank deposits uh, in the age of Silicon Valley Bank, as opposed to the the good old bank runs of of the 1930s. In the good old bank runs in the 1930s, it was about large numbers of people queuing up in front of the bank in order to get physical money uh, out of their bank accounts because they were afraid. Uh, and the funny thing about Silicon Valley Bank's uh, deposit crisis was that there was no queue. Uh, there were hardly 10 people out in the front door of, of the branches. Uh, the newspapers had a hard time trying to find a photograph that tried to show there was a bank run because the bank run happened uh all at once on a Sunday afternoon, uh, $60 billion just uh, evaporated uh, because it was a digital transaction, right? Now, take that into mortgages. Uh, today, an average mortgage takes Three months, uh, you know, depends on which country you're in, uh, to 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 be complete uh, to be completed. So from the time that you lodge a mortgage, uh, and the lawyers have to go out and look at all the caveats and uh, uh, and and you know and the holdings on the on the asset and so on, and then come back to say this is free of encumbrances, um, and then you find you end the transaction. Um, you know, you you begin to value a mortgage as uh, as being an asset in itself. But imagine what mortgages will look like uh, if the uh, information on all property uh, is contained on a blockchain uh, and and it's all digitized and it all can be verified in in one second. Um, you know the encumbrances, the you know the the caveats on on the property and all that, and then the transaction is completed uh, in one minute. Uh, you know, and and that can be done by a Gen Z or a, and now they call them Gen A or Gen, Generation Alpha has just been born, uh, who are native digital players. What do you think a mortgage or a or a property means to them? Uh, it's something that they can flip. Um, you know, at, at the touch of a button, um, you know, and and uh, the appreciation of value starts to change, uh, and the utilization of the assets starts to change. They put it on the network, uh, they share it with your friends, um, you know, they they make all that information available, uh, stuff like that, and and we see the building blocks of the network world uh, of asset and valuations in the network world uh, being built uh, in ver- various elements. Uh, you know, you take Airbnb, uh, it's actually uh, the democratization of assets. It is the liberalization of the value in an asset by making it uh, available for use by anybody. Now, take that one more level up uh, and that you don't have even have to own that asset to make that available. And then you take that one more level up uh, that you can flip the asset at any time you want. You know, that world is just within sight. Uh, and the people who are going to determine that world is not your generation or mine. Uh, you know, already we don't understand the Gen Zs, um, you know, and then when the Gen As come on, uh, you know, they'll be looking back at us and saying, why do you guys, you know, hide your bar of gold in the back of your bedroom? You know, uh, you know, we, we you know, we, for us, uh, <laughs> making it available to my friends, uh, that's where the value is. Uh, and it's a totally different universe that we are, we are uh, uh, ecosystem or you know civilization that we are that we are um, uh, you know sort of meandering towards. We're heading in that direction, uh, and and the elements of that of the of the future is already in place. Well, you know, it made me think of um, the value that is placed on being an influencer these days. 
Um, you know, in fact, I, I just recently did a transaction with a company uh, regarding knobs on a, an audio board. And one of the first questions they had when I joined their community was, are you an, an influencer? And then if you are, said yes, which I, I guess I met the criteria for that, they, yeah. they, they yes, wanted to know what your social media channels were. So I don't know if that means they're now verifying whether or not I, <laughs> I really am an influencer or I just think I'm an influencer. Um, I guess that remains to be seen. But it, it, it really yeah. struck me as a, how much, as you're saying, we, we put a, a new level of uh, importance upon that ability to be transparent enough and uh, of value personally enough that we actually can influence others. Um, that's my dream, and, and honestly. That's why, absolutely. And that's why your, your starting statement, which was lying, that, you know, was a very, very good, uh, you know, starting point because, um, you know, we are now, you know, moving into a, uh, uh, ecosystem where lying is exactly what doesn't create value. Uh, mm -hmm. Transparency and symmetry of information is exactly what creates value. And the next generation will look back at you and say, "Why was there a need to even lie in the first place?" Yeah. You know, um, you know that that by giving all my all the information that I have to into the network, that's what creates the value that you know that I have. Um, you know, and you you may not even like the information, but but that transparency is what creates that. And I think that influencer is just that, right? Which is um, you're putting out information out there, uh, things that people need to know. Right. Um, you right. know, and and so yeah, we are. Those are the building blocks. Well, I, mean, I see so much value in uh, what used to be commonplace. Um, things in our, our cultures and our societies and, and those being things like kindness, uh, compassion, empathy, um, that those, if there were a way to monetize, you know, and I, I don't mean that in a, a, a vulgar way, but to monetize the, the value of those things in a way that allowed a person who instilled those qualities into their character, that they would become more valuable. Um, you know, we, we have a, an entire political system that is based on the antithesis of that. We have a, a capitalization system that's based on power and abuse and corruption and, you know, winning, which I've always found to be, uh, you know, in order for there to be a winner, there has to be a loser. And what value is there to having a loser in any equation? I, I don't understand that thinking. Um, so so the capitalist world that we know today is transactional, it's markets driven, um, you know, and, and, and that's and I actually borrowed that idea from uh, a, a RAND corporation um, you know, analyst who wrote a paper in the 1990s saying that uh, human civilization moves uh, from its tribal to its institutional to its markets to its uh, network phases. Um, and we need to know which of the phases we are in or dealing with uh, to understand what the issues are. And that's why the market space is where lying is important because uh, the, the value is in the transaction. The winner takes it all. Um, you know, that's the market space. Network, um, you know, being out there uh, and being transparent is the value. Now, the interesting thing here is that uh, the personalization of finance, which then leads into the personalization of society, unfortunately, uh, accentuates uh, the ability to be narcissistic with truth. You know, the, the funny thing about narcissism is that uh, it's 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 a that gets perfected in the networked world uh, rather than in the transactional world, in the markets world. Uh, in the markets world, you actually have to be nice to each other to complete the transaction, although you're lying to each other. In the in the networked world, because you know everything about each other, uh, the uh, the ability to extract value also depends on on being selfish. Um, you know, so um, so I think that. Um, and I said that in the book that, um, you know, the personalization of finance also means that uh, the propensity to narcissism will, in, will increase. Um, and I think that people reading it will be wondering where I'm coming from for that. Uh, but um, when you look at 
you know, the Gen Zs and the, you know, the, the new generations that are coming on, uh, they, they're actually uh, incredibly able to be much more narcissistic than, than, than previous generations. Which is uh, worrisome for civilization, is it not? Um, if we can, yeah. So we will need we will need new rules of engagement, which have not been created as yet. Um, you know, and and the, we are starting to do that now. Uh, even in education, now now that with Chat GPT, you don't have to memorize everything. Uh, you know, and that any information you want, uh, you know, can be constructed for you. Uh, then the value of education just you know, changes, it pivots a totally different direction and you, and we need to articulate that uh, and, and then, and then uh, you know, spend time building that. So if uh, in the old education system, the whole idea is to ace the examination by demonstrating how much you remember uh, and now remembering is no longer the value, it's the questions that you ask that that makes you of greater value because your ability to use a, a device or a platform to to generate that information. So so then uh, you know uh, the 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 whole orientation of education is uh, learning how to ask the right questions. Uh, wow. You know and and then uh, you know being able to construct your own reality. Uh, you know based on your values uh, or something like that. Right. So so we are in the early days of uh, reconstructing uh, how education is. Um, um, incentivized uh, and then how society is organized, um, you know, and, and it's a long journey. And I think that uh, the people who have uh, asked for a uh, slowdown or a, or a moratorium on, on the growth of AI, uh, there's a point that, that uh, we really need to think a little bit about uh, what we are getting into uh, because uh, the, the process by which um, the freedom of information and the availability of information is going to, you know, rent society asunder is very, very powerful, um, you know, and, um, and and we are going to be paying a very high price in the next 10 years or so. Folks, my guest uh, this week is Emmanuel Daniel, as I like to think of him. He is uh, God is among us in the lion's den, and we have been talking about many subjects that affect us all in the lion's den of uh, monetary transactions. And uh, I, I think we're uh, we can continue the conversation, right? But we'll we'll divide we'll we'll stop this episode to give people an opportunity to have a week's worth of digestion, and uh, and uh, what would be the word? Uh, I'm, I'm thinking formation, but that's not correct. Uh, the the ability to uh, process, to synthesize this information, and return next week with even more. I have a whole list of questions. I think I I got into one of them. Uh, <laughs> so well, this could go on for quite a while. Uh, but Emmanuel is the author of a wonderful book called The Great Transition: The Personalization of Finance. Is here. Um, you can find that on Kindle. You can find that on Amazon. You can yep. get a hard copy or an electronic copy. So I'm personally trying That's to weed right. my way through the, the electronic copy. But, uh, Daniel, a pleasure talking with you, and we're going to talk some more. So, folks, join us next week for part two uh, of this conversation. And uh, please come willing to think about things that perhaps you have never thought about before, but we all do need to think about. Uh, take care. Thanks, so. Thanks, Joe.